Welcome to the Teaching Value in Healthcare Learning Network. Join us to hear leaders in the field share practical and tangible advice about how to teach and deliver high value care. With national concerns about rising healthcare costs, as well as overuse and misuse of medical care, Costs of Care, in partnership with the ABIM Foundation, hosts an open forum to discuss ways to initiate, implement, and sustain feasible innovations in value at your institutions. I'm September Wallingford, the Operations Director for Costs of Care, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Today we're talking with Dr. Juan Brito from the Mayo Clinic. At the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Brito is an Assistant Professor of Medicine, the Medical Director of the Shared Decision-Making National Resource Center, and an investigator in the Knowledge and Evaluation Research Unit. He's here to discuss the innovative topic, cost conversations. Hi, Dr. Brito. Hi, Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having um, me. Yes. Maybe we could start by having you share a little bit more about your role as an investigator in the Knowledge and Evaluation Research Unit at Mayo. Yes, delighted. Uh, so the Knowledge and Evaluation Research Unit um, came about in 2004, 2005. Uh, initially, the, the goal of this unit was to synthesize the evidence in a way that clinicians and patients can make sense of the evidence and help patients um, making good decisions. As we were evolving in this evidence synthesis, it was clear to us that it's not enough to synthesize the evidence, or was not that helpful just to synthesize the evidence, but we wanted to also help clinicians make use of that evidence in a way that certainly provides um, treatment options to the patients and find a treatment that fits the patient's values and needs. So that led us to understand the role of shared decision making in the ecosystem of caring, meaning that one of the aspects of caring is the evidence, but the second aspect of caring is really understanding what matters to the patients. So shared decision making was our, our, our next approach, and we have been spending approximately eight, nine years of research in shared decision making to try to, again, help patients and clinicians have meaningful conversations about what to do next. That's great and incredible. And, um, and, you know, when you talk about decision making, uh, you could talk about cost conversations and discussing costs. Um, and it's no surprise that the out of pocket costs for patients continue to rise, um, imposing extreme financial distress on our patients and their caregivers. And um, we're very interested at Cost of Care about cost conversations. And uh, you shared a statistic with me that only one in eight medical encounters includes a cost conversation. So I'm just wondering, how would you define a cost conversation? So yes, yeah, that's a very good question. And um, so as we were understanding the role of shared decision making in encounters, uh, one approach that we use is actually videotaping encounters. So we go, with cameras or we are there while clinicians and patients interact you know, about different conditions, different decisions, different treatment options, things like that. And something that became very obvious is that there was an elephant in the room, is that cost, how much actually is gonna cost me, the, the test that you're gonna order, the treatment that I have chosen. And when we talk to patients after these encounters, when we ask them what matters to you the most, is actually cost came up very often, and yet that was not addressed. So we quantified in these uh, hundreds of videos that we have from different conditions in different settings, emergency settings, uh, outpatient setting, hospital settings. We, we were watching say, okay, what, how often does the clinician or the patient actually bring up the issue of cost? It's, it's only about uh, 15% of the times, 15 to 20% of the times. And that is consistent with the literature, the different cross-sectional studies that do suggest that only about 20, maybe 30% in some studies, uh, clinicians bring the issue of cost on the table, meaning at the time of decision making. So that clearly is something that was a gap between what patients need, what clinicians want to also discuss, but what's happening. And then we, we saw that there is different spectrums of cost conversation. So there was the typical conversation of, I'm giving you the prescription for a medicine and telling you, by the way, it might cost you that much. 
or you know you can go to a Walgreens or, or, or Walmart and maybe find a cheaper version of this. So it was a cost conversation that it was not that helpful in the sense that was not part of decision making. It was just at the tail of the prescription process as a way to finalize the conversation. So that's one kind of cost conversation. But there was more meaningful cost conversations in which cost was discussed and the attribute of the options of treatment. For instance, mm -hmm. patients choosing diabetes medications, they were thinking, okay, there are different medications for diabetes that makes me lose weight um, or, may, or, may, or might help me with lowering my A1C in a greater magnitude. But incorporating cost in that process of decision making actually is rich and is richer than just discussing cost at the end of the conversation because patients can say, oh, the one that makes me lose weight actually is $8 a day even though they might be pills. So that's too much for me. It's almost, you know, it's, it's a significant amount of money per month. So incorporating costs into the decision-making process clearly is the best way to, to do it. And we have seen that among the 20% of cost conversations, those meaningful conversations are actually much um, lesser. So maybe 5% or, 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 or less. So there is a need to support this cost conversation. So, why? Why we need to support it? Because we have seen that when it happens in the right way, uh, actually that leads to a meaningful outcomes. Um, doctors kind of bring issues of, okay, let's change to a more um, equal effective alternative, less expensive alternative. Or let's change your follow-up appointment in a way that you can come less often, um, but we can still monitor closely. So there were many changes that happened after these cost conversations that actually were meaningful in terms of cost saving strategies. So also patients thought that by incorporating costs, they were able to make more meaningful decision process or they, uh, decided in a way that fits, you know, practically what they can do and afford. So uh, yes, we are seeing that in the videos and clearly we see the value of cost conversations. Absolutely, and you raise um, a great point about uh, incorporating it during the encounter and during the decision-making process. And um, some of the things that we hear is that cost conversations might be time-consuming, um, but what you're kind of talking about and what um, you know maybe has been demonstrated is that when you incorporate it into the decision-making, you're actually saving time on the back end or you're saving the patient from not being able to adhere to the medication regimen because it's too expensive. Um, so maybe if you'd want to talk a little bit about the time that it takes to incorporate cost conversation. Um, no, delighted. So th there is no question that a good conversation takes time. And by no means, we should dedicate less time to meaningful conversation. Actually, I advocate to have more time with patients to have meaningful conversations. The reason for this is the following. Just by getting to know your patients better, you can provide better care. Biological data, meaning lab data, x-ray data, imaging data, is not enough to take care of patients. So really, to get to know your patients better, you have to invest. And to invest, you need um, at least the first encounter or the following encounter, at least the following, to try to understand who, who is the human being in front of you. And a, a chunk of that piece, a chunk of the biography of the patient, meaning the life of the patient is about finances. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's worthwhile investing time, understanding the context of the patient in order to understand what follows. So I do believe this is an investment strategy. So you, if you have a meaningful conversation at once, I do believe that the following conversations and the following encounters will actually be shorter and more meaningful because you know what to address and you know how to address it. So by yes, uh, yes, it, it does take more time. In our, in our research, decision-making process that is meaningful takes three more minutes in average. But we believe that those three minutes are worthwhile spending. Yeah, absolutely. And You've developed a tool, probably many tools, at the Mayo Clinic. Um, so I wondered if you could tell us more about uh, the tools and maybe describe for someone how they might implement that at their institution or in their practice. Yeah, delighted. So 
there are two big approaches to decision making um, and to support patients in decision making. One approach, which is the vast majority of, of interventions, is to give patients information. In other words, you go to see a doctor for whatever condition, and they provide before you see the doctor a documentation for you to read or a DVD of a video for you to watch. So they want to inform patients about the condition so they become more experts about it. That is an, is an approach that was needed when, you know, if the main problem would be lack in information. We believe the main problem is not lack of information, it's actually lack of meaningful conversations with patients. So the approach that we have is to support patients and clinicians having these meaningful conversations. So we develop tools that are electronic tools that help patients and clinicians elaborate on what matters the most for both of them. So one example of that is the diabetes card. So we have electronic cards that helps clinicians navigate the difficult options of treatment uh, for patients in a way that the final decision fits intellectually, emotionally, and practically the patient. Um, so the way that we develop this tool is by watching encounters, talking to patients, talking to clinicians. We use a very user-centered approach to make this happen. So in other words, the tool is, is meant to fit the problem of the practice, and we prototype these tools within the practice until we know that shared decision making is happening. So as part of these tools, um, one of the typical options or typical attributes is cost. So we do incorporate cost in these decision aids. But the cost information that we convey there is not not the actual out-of-pocket cost is an estimate of how much somebody will pay if they don't have an insurance, which is an important limitation of, 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 of the work that we do, is that we cannot provide the right estimates. But nevertheless, incorporating cost conversations within the decision aids increase the frequency and likely the quality of cost conversations fourfold. So from 20%, the cost conversation frequency go up to 80%. So that's a significant improvement of those. But the six that we were able to find do not have a significant impact in the frequency of cost conversations. So have, they have an indirect impact, but not something that is easy to measure. So in that sense, I think the approach of it supporting short decision making, and by supporting decision making, having cost conversation is ideal. And we are seeing that with our tools. So the tools that we have are, are available for free in the shared decision making website at Mayo Clinic. We have uh, tools for different conditions such as diabetes and um, cardiovascular risk reduction. We have one for Graves disease, which is a type of condition. We have for osteoporosis. And we have at least 15 or more of those coming into the website in the following months. The, tool, uh, the tools have been tested in clinical trials, so we test the tools in trials in which we compare the use of the tool in a group that are using the tool versus a group not using the tool, and we measure outcomes such as the quality of the conversation, satisfaction, adherence, um, and other meaningful outcomes. So uh, once that we have proven that they're actually useful, we put it in the website, and again, they're accessible for free, they are built in a way that they can be embedded into the major um, EMR systems in the United States, so Cerner Epic. So they are built with a platform uh, that's called Fire, uh, Smart on Fire uh, platform. So if someone, for instance, is interested in, in embedded these, embedding these tools into the uh, workflow, uh, it is uh, technically possible. And we offer that as, 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 an, as an extra in terms of uh, you can do it, just let us know. And uh, we're happy to provide the IT information for you to do it locally. So uh, again, the, the source and the, the logic of this is that we, don't, uh, we want people to use tools that have been proven to be effective. That's the main goal here. We have had at least three or four implementation projects of these tools in different healthcare systems. And in those projects, we have learned that Clinicians want to use it. 80% of people actually, uh, clinicians want to use it again. The main limitation that we have found is that, um, you know, the system is not set up to support meaningful conversations in a way. So um, doctors are being asked to do more. Uh, patients become more uh, co complicated in terms of morbidities. 
So the system is coming to the way that only they have eight minutes to see a patient and they, and they have four extra minutes to do paperwork. So in different settings that do not, are, are not centered in the patient, the use of tools like this will never work. So it has to be the right cultural fit. And depending on the, the stage of, of, of learning that a, a healthcare system might be, the tools might be easily embedded, easily implemented, or sometimes it will never actually work, depending on what that institution or that hospital might be in the patient-centered approach. So, and you talk about these tools. Um, can you just give an example of how would a clinician broach this topic and um, you know, initiate using this tool with a patient? How we start usually using the decision aids is by understanding that there are two different agendas in the encounter. So one agenda is the is the more guideline center or clinician center agenda. Uh, for instance, in the conversation with osteoporosis, we want to talk about your bone density results. I mean, in how weak your bones are, and we use something that is called T S score. The T S score tell us how weak your bones are. And clinicians usually say, oh, your, bones, your bone density is this, your bones are weak. But that's not really a patient-centered agenda. We have learned, for instance, to start this conversation, the best way is to describe what is the risk of breaking a bone in the next 10 years. So that is more patient-centered because breaking a bone, if you break a hip in the next 10 years, you might not be able to walk again in a way that you can exercise, hike, or do the things that you enjoy most in your life. So that's how we change the agenda. And by changing the agenda to a more situation-driven problem, patient situation-driven problem, the conversation follows in a different way. How do you get accurate price transparency information? Um, I think that's a huge elephant in the room, that price transparency isn't the be-all, end-all to these cost conversations, but um, I think that clinicians have trouble getting price transparency information at all? So how do you obtain that information? So good question. And the short answer is we cannot yet. And the long answer is this one. So the, I has been always amazed um, to the fact that when I talk to patients about the cause, um, I do not know exactly how much I need to pay, but they just go from my room, they take an elevator, Three, floor, three floors below me, and they go to the pharmacies, and the pharmacies can take, tell them exactly how much they need to pay. So why the pharmacies or the system that the pharmacies have provides them with the tools to support this cost conversation there, which is less meaningful than having the conversation when you are making a decision. So we have been trying to figure it out why the system is set up in this way. And there are many, limit, there are many reasons for it, but one of the ways that we can break, the, break that kind of algorithm is by developing technology for us to interact with payers or the system to interact with payers at the, at the level of encounters. And there are some companies that have developed the technology already. So one project that we're going to start soon is working with some companies that develop the technology to incorporate a, or to find the right price and to emerge this right price into the tools that we have. So when the tools are used, they are not only used to support the treatment option conversation, but they also have the right cost information. So it would be helpful for clinicians also to see that there. And uh, the technology is there. It's just a matter of merging both technologies and running, um, of course, a research, research project and implementation project. So we are doing that now. And uh, we are we we have get got some funding to make it happen, and it is very likely that in the next year or two we will have some results in terms of how uh, using this price transparency can benefit the patients and clinicians in a meaningful way. One of the outcomes that we are very interested in is adherence, meaning the ability or the frequency of number of patients that are able to continue on the medication, and and for a long time, or just the number of patients that can feel the prescription that the clinicians uh, provided. So we are measuring those outcomes in, the, in this proposal because we believe the hypothesis is that by making a good decision process, by having a good decision process that incorporates the right 
cause, patients might be more likely to be adherent or more likely to fill the first prescription than the other ones that they don't have the information. Absolutely. And that, that makes sense. And so that'll be really exciting to see what kind of results that you're um, able to measure. Um, and then as we finish up, um, I'd just like to give you the opportunity to share anything, um, any final last words on the topic of cost conversations. Yes, uh, I think it's, it's, um, it's something that patients need. It's something that clinicians want to help but it is, is, is has been neglected for uh, many times. So the system and the healthcare spending demands that we have cost conversations with patients. Um, the technology is there. It's just a matter of putting the pieces together. There are other pieces that need to happen is that we, we should also work, be working on measuring the quality of cost conversation in a more meaningful way. Um, and we don't have a, me a, a, a metric to measure this yet. I mean, if you are able to quantify the quality of cost conversation in a particular institution, well, there is not one measure. They, I think there is one that has been developed and is being tested, but the, we don't have a richness of, of measures that we can use to see if one institution actually is having more cost conversation with the patients than institution B. Also, it's important that each institution, uh, they assess the satisfaction of the patient because it's part of the quality improvement process to assess satisfaction. It might be that having cost conversations might be linked to the satisfaction in a way that we don't understand completely. So there is really room to understand all those outcomes that we are measuring right now, how much of those are actually due to the finances, financial toxicity of cost conversations in that matter. So there is a lot of work to do in terms of research, quality improvement, implementation of cost conversations. And it's an important topic for patients. It's an important topic for healthcare in general and also for policy. Great. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. And a very special thank you to Dr. Brito and the Mayo Clinic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. For more information on Dr. Brito's work, please visit shareddecisions.mayoclinic.org. For more Cost of Care Learning Network webinars, please visit costofcare.org backslash learning hyphen network. Listen to us on soundcloud.com at teaching value or follow us on Twitter at Cost of Care. <laughs>